If I thought <clears throat> of something that I thought I would like for people to remember me by, is uh, overcoming the barriers that destroy meaning for your life. I think one of the most difficult struggles I've had is making my life meaningful. It's very easy to settle for nothing and end up living a life that really makes very little difference. Uh, I always wanted, I wanted to find meaning in my life because I was able to make a difference somewhere. I was able to invest my talents in a way that brought about some kind of change. Now, here I'm not looking for any, any position of nobility of anything like that, but how do I affect the life of people around me? How do I live? And I'd like to be remembered as a person who uh, found meaning in his life in some way in, by giving it away, by giving it away, by giving his life away, giving it to others, being concerned about others. I think, I think the biggest struggle any person has is, is, is living a meaningful life, a meaningful life. The story of civil rights is the story of the power of civil disobedience at work with nonviolence. Now that's, those are two very radical concepts. Civil disobedience at work with nonviolence. Then the story of civil rights is the story of the power of relationships to reach beyond political and economic limits. Civil rights is a kind of activity that calls people to live in a way that reaches beyond that. They're willing to contest practices of the past, cultural commitments. I think sometimes we don't realize the tremendous cultural commitment to the separation of races. Uh, when I first came here, there was a family trying to have a little family picnic in Brackenridge Park. They were run out of that Brackenridge Park by the policeman. He had no authority to do that. But they could not fight back because the community supported that kind of action. Now that, that was the sentiment of the time. It was, not, it was not just some mean white person doing something. And what it caused you to do as a result of that, you began to think white and black rather than individuals. The greatest liberation I had in my own life was to have a close relationship with a white student at Andrew Newton Seminary. You know, I, I didn't know him as an individual. I knew him as a white person. Therefore, I didn't expect anything out of him other than some, something that I didn't particularly like. It was through that young man that I was liberated because that's an enslavement. When you get to the point where you cannot receive persons as individuals, you're enslaved by that concept. You can never move out beyond it. You're going to always find yourself restricted in your relationships, in your understanding, in your openness. And we're about to get that way in terms of the world cultures. Mm -hmm. and we're not, you know, we're about to, we're about to say, if, he's, if, he's, uh, if he does this, if he has this kind of religion, if he has, wears this kind of clothes, if he lets his hair go wrong and all of this, then something, we better be watching. He's going to blow up something. And as a result of that, if we get that kind of spirit going, we, we're going to have real problems in a global community. Finally, I started thinking about this. I said, you know, I am supporting, I am help, I'm a helper to this whole idea of, of racism. And I'm not going to do this anymore. So I called a man. I said, listen, I, I will baptize all of them, 
white and black. I don't care who they are. Uh, or, or else I won't baptize any of them. I'm not going to baptize some black and some whites go to other places and be baptized. I'm not going to make that distinction because I don't think it's right. They never, after that, they didn't send me anybody. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just give one illustration of that because it fits into this, this uh, picture of, of, of civil rights. Uh, two young women had come to my office out of a housing project and were complaining about the fact that police had come there, arrested them, and carried them to jail in their gowns. Well, that, that irritated me. I said, These, you don't violate a person's dignity. You can arrest them, but don't violate their worth. And they're violating this worth. So sitting in my own office I, I, on, a, on a day that the city council was being held, I went to the city council and said, I want to report police activity. And when you talked about the police, Anyway, you were in trouble because you just didn't, didn't make any charges against the police system. And, and I think in a measure it's still that way, but it was worse then. So I went and I said, now, I would like a committee from the council to investigate the charges that I'm bringing. I said, because I just think uh, it lays the groundwork for a great deal more friction, a great deal more. If those men are going out there doing this, you, you're laying the groundwork for a lot of more trouble, and we can stop it now. They asked me, well, you tell us what did the, who were the people that complained? I said, I'm not going to tell you in open council who the people are that complain. I said, but I will report it to a committee. You give me a council committee, and I'll talk to them about it. But I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to expose those women to additional hostility by giving you names in this open council. Uh, they dismissed me. <laughs> and the next day, there was a small, small part of an editorial that said, we need to stop these people from coming into council, bringing a lot of stuff and disrupting the work of the council. Now, what I'm saying is, there are risks out there. If you're going to deal with substantive things, there are risks. You've got to be willing to accept that risk. Uh, the, because then I was regarded as troublemaker, create trouble, making problems. But I was dealing with what I thought was basic, and that was human dignity. Treat people with dignity. I don't care who they are, treat them with dignity.